It was Riel who said, my people will fall asleep for a hundred years, and it will be the artists and the singers who wake them. And so it is that, and it is through them, that we are beginning now to understand what it is that we have slept through or we have been put to sleep through. I'm a uh, Justice of the Court of Queen's Bench in Manitoba. I've been a judge now for 26 years. I was appointed in 1988. And since the time that um, I was appointed a judge, I have presided over three inquiries now. It's very rare for a judge to do any inquiries. Maybe they don't want me in the courtroom, I'm not sure. They keep giving me these assignments to do. I presided over the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. We studied the relationship between Aboriginal people and the justice system in Manitoba. And then I was asked a few years later if I would look into the deaths of 12 babies who died at the hands of a surgeon in Winnipeg. And then more recently, of course, I was asked if I would take on responsibility to preside over this commission. This commission is unique. It's different from other commissions around the world because its very name tells you what it's attempting to do. Most commissions are called commissions of inquiry. The essential feature of it is to inquire into things and then to write a report. We're not only required to look at the truth determination process, so we are called upon to inquire into things, but we're also called upon to look at the issue of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a tricky topic. One of the first things we did as a commission staff when we got together with the commissioners and uh, other advisors that were working with us was to develop a working definition for reconciliation. And so I said to the staff, in preparation for that meeting, I want everybody to sit down and write a definition of reconciliation. We came up with 128 different meanings for the word reconciliation. 128. So you can see how complicated the question of reconciliation is. Reconciliation is different for an accountant. You know, to an accountant, you've got to reconcile one side of the sheet to the other side of the sheet. Reconciliation means something different to a defense lawyer. And uh, in a criminal case, reconciliation means something different to a divorce lawyer. You know, are the parties able to get back together? In fact, as judges, we always ask the parties during divorce proceedings, is there any possibility of reconciliation? Because if there is, you're not going to get a divorce. So reconciliation is one of those words that requires a context. And so we realized that with all of these possible definitions, it was up to us to set the context. And the context is, what were the schools all about? And what was the relationship between Aboriginal and people, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal people in this country all about? And then maybe we can talk about how reconciliation fits into that context. So that's what we've endeavored to do. You've heard from uh, some of Susan's comments and perhaps from other things that you've read or you've heard that the government of Canada shortly after Confederation established residential schools for the purpose of gathering up all the indigenous children that they could gather and put them into facilities which they called schools, for the purpose of indoctrinating them into another culture, teaching them how to be Canadians, taking them away from their families so that their families wouldn't have any influence over their retention of their own culture, they wouldn't have any influence over their retention of their language, wouldn't have any influence over their knowledge about their own history, their knowledge about their own culture, or their knowledge about the aspirations of the community that they came from to continue on its own course of independence from the government of Canada. Before Confederation, in law and in, in all other aspects of the word, Aboriginal people were pretty independent from the overall scheme of things. The government of Canada exercised no control over Aboriginal people in Western Canada and Northern Canada. And it was only after Confederation when the British North America Act gave jurisdiction to the federal government over Indians and lands reserved for Indians that the government of Canada decided to set out on a course of bringing all of those people under the government control through the use of treaty. 
Treaty making process began shortly after Confederation in 1867 and it began in earnest, but it was primarily for the purpose of getting access to the land and the resources that were in the West and in the North. This land and resources are very important to the government because the government of Canada wanted to expand. You know, from your knowledge of Canadian history, that the original Dominion of Canada was what is now Lower Southern Ontario, Southern Quebec around St. Lawrence and the Maritime Provinces with the exception of Newfoundland Labrador. So that was all that Canada consisted of initially. But Canada wanted to go from sea to sea to sea. Wanted everything, all of that territory. Because they didn't want the Americans who were looking at expanding into the west and ultimately to go up north towards what is now Alaska. That was part of the American dream. Concept of manifest destiny. Sir John A. Macdonald, who was the Prime Minister of the country at the time, he wanted to cut that off. He wanted to get to that far western shore as quickly as possible. But the government in England passed the North American, British North America Act, said you've got to deal with the Indian title to the land. You can't ignore it. You can't just go traipsing across that territory. You actually have to deal with Indian title. And so that's what they did. And they met resistance right from the beginning. You know about the Red River Rebellion, as it's called? Actually, it wasn't a rebellion, it was just a resistance. They said to the government of Canada, you can't come in here unless you talk to us and get our consent. Led by Louis Riel, but Indian leadership in the prairies was just as adamant. And so the government proceeded to set out to enter into those treaties. First treaty negotiation started in 1870, ended in the 1871 treaty known as Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 3, and 1873, a number of treaties were signed only with the people the government considered as Indians. They didn't deal with the Métis in the same way. And they certainly weren't interested in talking to the Inuit who were way up in the north and kind of beyond the vision of the government of Canada at the time. So they were forced to look at those in the land who were called Indians at that time. And they entered into those treaties and basically they prepared documents and sent the treaty negotiators out there to get them to sign over land transfers. So the land transfer documents were the initial treaties. But the Indian negotiators said, just hold on a moment. We're not prepared to sign just the land transfer. We want some promises. We want some assurances first. So they negotiated a number of provisions. Treaty number one is known by the fact when it was signed in 1870, Treaty number one is known for the fact that there was another agreement that had to be signed called the Outside Promises Agreement. So treaty number one was signed and then the government had to draw up another agreement to cover up all of the other, cover off all of the other things that the Indians negotiated for. And one of those other things was schools. All of the Indian negotiators wanted schools built in their communities for the purpose of educating their kids because they knew with this new dominion coming into the West, this new government coming into the West, that things were changing. And they wanted to be part of that change. They wanted to be full partners in this growth. And so among other things, they demanded the government agree to build schools on their reserves in exchange for them giving up title to all the other territory that they were giving up title to. And the government promised to do that. There is a schools clause in every single treaty in Western Canada after Confederation. All of the Indian negotiators wanted those schools built in their communities under their control. Government would pay for all of that. But it wasn't long after that that the government decided to go a different way when it came to education. They weren't interested in building local, local schools under local control because that meant the Indians would continue to maintain their independence and their separateness. Instead, they decided that they were going to gather up all the Indians using the American model of industrial schools that was made famous through Carlisle Indian Industrial School. They decided to take all of the Indians that they could identify and move them into similar kinds of schools. They called them industrial and training schools initially, but they came to call them residential schools as well. And by the 1880s, the residential school program was well on its way. And it didn't take long for there to be 
discontent among the Indian leadership over the fact that these schools were being built. Part of that discontent was over the way that their kids were being treated because from the moment that those children arrived in the schools, they were subject to treatment that today we would call demeaning, humiliating, they were shamed, and they were disciplined to the point of being abused. They were told that they were inferior, that they were dirty, they were heathens, they were savages, that their people were irrelevant, their people had no culture worth protecting, and that they had to accept this new idea of God because Christianization was the vehicle that the government chose in order to civilize these savages. And that was the approach that was consistent throughout the whole term of the residential schools from the 1870s well into 1996 when the last residential school closed down. 125 years of residential schools. Seven generations of children went through those schools. And in those schools, every single child who was brought into those schools was told that they could not speak their language, they could not practice their culture, that their people were inferior, their people were savages, their people were heathens, and that the only salvation that remained for them was if they were to adapt a lifestyle that was more consistent with Canadian culture. And that lifestyle included Christianity. There's nothing wrong with Christianity, but forcibly stuffing it down the throats of those people who don't understand it whose parents would not have agreed to it is what's wrong with what they did. And doing it in a way that resulted in injury to children when they resisted was also not acceptable. In the 1980s, and after all of this period of time during which the schools were in place, it became known that many children had been injured while they were in those schools. And those injured children, now adults, started to sue the government and the churches that ran the schools. And those lawsuits were resisted by the government and the churches very vigorously until right to the Supreme Court of Canada, courts were saying that the government could be sued. Some courts said you can't sue the government for doing what they thought was best. But in a decision called Blackwater, the Supreme Court of Canada said if a child has been injured in the school by somebody working for the school, the government and the church running that school can be sued for that injury. And that opened the floodgates. Within a very short period of time, 36,000 lawsuits were commenced in the various courts of Canada, ultimately reaching 60,000 lawsuits. The courts were overwhelmed. They couldn't deal with it. And so the courts themselves, along with the defendant churches and the defendant government, got together with representatives of the survivors and they negotiated a class action process. It resulted in the largest class action lawsuit ever seen in the history of this country. And the government decided they were going to go to court in this class action. But even a class action of that magnitude is going to have a hard time getting through the court process. And so the courts encouraged the parties to see if they could work out a settlement, and they did, ultimately. As a result of the efforts of a lot of people, Phil Fontaine, the leader of the Assembly of First Nations at the time, Frank Iacobucci, former Supreme Court Justice, was appointed to represent the government, and representatives of the various churches finally began to see a way to resolving these cases more to make it easier for people to go through the process. And the resolution of that resulted in the largest class action settlement agreement in the history of this country. Five billion, that's with a B, five billion dollars was set aside as compensation fund for the settlement of the injuries that were sustained in, in the schools. And there were two funds that were created. One was for all students who went to the school. Everybody received a payment for having been taken away from their families, having been demeaned in that way, having been denied their culture, having been denied their language, having been separated from their families. 
in such a way that it resulted in long-term damage to their own sense of self, their own sense of identity. But in addition to that, a second fund was created for those who were actually injured by something that happened in the school. 80,000 people made claims for the first fund. 37,000 people have made claims for the second fund. Almost half of the people who have been to residential schools who are still alive claim to have suffered some sort of physical, serious physical injury. We're not just talking about having been slapped in the hand or hit on the side of the head. We're talking about injuries that resulted in long-term damage to these individuals. 37,000. There was a cutoff date that was put in the settlement agreement. You had to be alive on May the 12th of 2005 in order to make a claim. So all of those who died before that date couldn't make a claim. And still 80,000 people made claims. There are probably more people who didn't make claims for one reason or the other. And all of those who passed away before that date were locked out and their families locked out of the settlement process. The children of the residential school survivors were not entitled to make a claim of any kind, even though they too suffered the consequences of what happened to the children in those schools. Because when those children came home from the schools and started having their own families, we know that they suffered from the fact that they didn't know how to parent. You can't learn how to be a mother if you're raised in an institution. From the time that they were five until the time they were 17, those young people were kept in a school and they were not allowed to go home, many of them. They were not allowed to live in a family environment. You can't learn to parent when there are no babies in your life. And we know that there were babies who were born in the schools. We know that some of the girls were sexually abused, became pregnant and had babies. And we've heard stories about what happened to them. But those children that were born in the schools to the extent that they were born were never acknowledged to the point where they were retained there. They were separated immediately, sent away we're told that some of them were killed. We haven't found any evidence of that yet, but I have no reason to doubt the stories of the survivors who say they saw that and heard about that. But nonetheless, growing up in an environment like that harms you, even if you were not physically hurt. But the physical injuries that those who were damaged by the physical abuse and the sexual abuse is very significant. Mental health study was done of residential school survivors by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation in 2007. And they looked at a number of residential school survivors to determine what the mental health impacts of residential schools were upon them. And they discovered that almost every single one of them was suffering from some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. It became a catchphrase after a while so that the psychological community decided to reevaluate the use of the term. But those who were in the residential schools suffered in the same way that those who've been to war suffered, just from seeing the violence, never mind experiencing it as well. It is hard for me to bring to you an awareness of just what that did to a person. The only way you can ever understand is to hear it from a survivor. So I want you to hear it from a survivor. That's the first video that I brought for you. I want to begin by just saying to those of you who are in this room, who may be a survivor of residential schools or may be concerned about the possibility of being affected by this video, I, I welcome you to step out if you wish because it is intense. But it is a video that children can watch because there are no specific details in it. Uh, so this person who's going to talk to us is not going to give any details about the actual sexual abuse that he experienced. But he will tell you what it did to his life. And he will tell you what he did to others in his life as a result of that experience. So I want you to watch this, then I'm going to talk about it. And then we're going to talk about what it is that we can do about this altogether. 
I thought I would be to face the demons that haunted me for 49 years. But I see today and, and since Monday that it still affects me for the things that happened through the 49 years that I kept hidden in me. I left uh, home and I didn't know why or where I was going, but I went into a play with my sister and brother back, back in 1960, 62, 61, 62. And then we came to this building that used to sit across here. And then they separated us. I don't know why they separated us, but like stories I've heard, their clothes were taken, mine was taken as well. My parents bought me some clothing before I came. It was taken from me and I had to know what they had given to me. My winter clothes also was taken. Never did see them again. After our separation my, from my sister and brother, I was unable to speak to them again. My mom had come to visit me at one time and I couldn't even see her. And I was taken from my bed with my mouth covered and into the and I don't remember going into the room his room. I developed a scab between my crotch from my, from my, below my belly button right down through my inner thighs. I don't know how long I was like that. I had to walk with my legs spread. And I was too scared to go see the sister, the nun, or the, the, the nurse because I didn't know what to say. Somehow it got healed, but I carried that, that sexual abuse and assault for 49 years. And that's what impacted that residential, that, not the residential school, but the person impacted my life until I was 49. My first wife passed away in 2007. She never even knew about this. But I, but I contemplated suicide in 1989. But it's by the grace of God that I sit here today. It's by the grace of God that he stopped me. I thought, what are my children and my wife was going to say, how are they going to live seeing their dad dead in the port? I no longer live by the number 142. I'm Paul Mugrak, and I have the right to live. <laughs> and I have the right to be happy, because I know I deserve it. And my children, if they can hear me, they had the right to come say, Dad, we didn't like what you did. And I can say I know and I'm sorry. And I thank this gathering here for listening to my story. It hasn't been an easy road. But we're not alone in it. Thank you. I think it's really important that uh, uh, survivors have the courage to tell their story to this commission. Sure, we, we're still emotional, but they become less and less the more you, you talk about it and you deal with uh, people who can help you in that, in that field that, you know, that the abuse that you suffered, uh, eventually you're going to have to let it go. Through these type of events, with lot of support and stuff like that, we can share our stories, we can begin healing.
and maybe that's why I turned out to be the person the way I was. I don't think I was the best parent. I know that kind of hurts. Uh, you know, uh, those things are the ones that are painful. Uh, but the one thing, though, Your Honor, they didn't respect people with disability. I had a problem with, I had a hearing problem. I was mocked. I was teased. I was picked on. I kept it inside. I kept it inside. Never told my parents about it. Your Honor, these kind of things we went through at school, we had no right at all. Thank you. It took you how many years to get it out of your system? Uh, today. Yeah. Today. I never told my kids about it.